So you may wonder why racial inequalities are so persistent. Um, how is it that we have we see so much inequality by race in the United States and its continuation from generation to generation? Um, and you can ask this question about race, and you can actually ask this question about lots of different groups or things. So um, a central um, puzzle for us is going to be why inequality persists um, if we have social programs or um, visions of the composition of a society that should challenge the existence of such inequality. Um, and first, I just want to show you um, what trends in racial inequality look like in the United States. And this, get, this shows us um, the relationship between income, median household income, between white families and black families in the United States between 1967 and 2015. So um, on the far left-hand side of the graph, you see 1967, where the average uh, black family was making around $27,000 a year, and the average white family was making probably around $46,000 a year. And then fast forward to 2015, you see conditions where the average black family is making around $40,000 a year, and the average white family is making around $61,000, $62,000 a year. And what this should immediately show you is that racial gaps in some dimensions of inequality, like income and wealth, haven't changed or worsened since the 1960s. But this is kind of phenomenal. I mean, in 60 years, there's been very, very little progress made in racial inequality. There's some progress made, but overall, there are huge differences in the overall incomes of black and white families. And if you think for a moment about cumulative advantage, this is year by year. So um, each year, you know, the average white family is making considerably more than the average black family. And at that additional amount may not just be, isn't just that there's this gap within a year, it's that there's the gap the next year, the following year, and that those gaps may accumulate over time. Now, this is income inequality. And when we income is the amount of money that a family makes in any one year. Income can have a number of sources. Some income can come from transfers. So um, wealthy families may transfer money intergenerationally from year to year. So wealthy parents could give their children money. That's a very small portion of income. It could come from employment. So employment produces income gains for people. So that's this is by far, where almost everyone has their income. And then it can come from returns on dividends. This is a very small portion of income for the vast majority of people. Very wealthy people have income in this way, but it's like if you own a lot of stock and the stock comes with dividends, and so you, and you, if you don't reinvest that, if you take it as income, that could also be income. Very few people rely upon that as a form of income. It's only extremely wealthy people. So overall, this is differences in employment. And part of what explains this is differences in employment rates, that is the um, amount that people are working or the number of people by different ethnic groups who are employed. And some of it is explained by um, uh, the kinds of jobs that you have. So if you have a high paying job, obviously you're gonna make more than a lower paying job. And one of the things that we see is that whites are more likely to be employed and more likely to have higher paying jobs than black Americans. So, um, uh, um, the, the other thing is that some of this is explained by things that are not race. So I want you to remember um, or think about the spuriousness uh, lecture that I gave in the methods section, where we talked about this, like how impacts could be spurious. And that is that it looks like there's a relationship between two things, but actually there's something else that's explaining both of the outcomes. So one question would be, if you look at these trends in racial inequality, is there anything else that would be correlated with race that could also explain this outcome? So I want you to think about that for a second. Is there some other factor that's related to race that could also explain 
trends in racial inequality. And I'm just gonna say that there are several other factors here. One of them is the level of education. Whites on average have higher rates of education than blacks do. Some of it is family structure. Whites are more likely to live in two parent households and those two parents are more likely to both receive incomes. That's gonna improve household income overall. So part of inequality between black and white families has nothing to do with race. It has to do with other things like education and family structure. But even as we control for all those things, or even as in a better way, we take into account all of those differences, correlated differences between blacks and whites, we still see huge levels of inequality between the groups. And for someone like me, that residual inequality, that remaining inequality, after we take into account all the other things, is a profound example of discrimination. I will say that even some of the things that we are using to explain away some of this inequality, like different levels of education, can also be the product of inequality. I mean, uh, discrimination. So let, let me put that a little bit more clearly. Sorry about that. that just, you know, the, the fact that Black Americans and white Americans have different rates of education and that that could explain some of the inequality doesn't just mean that we should think like, well, that's not discrimination, because there could be discriminatory reasons for why it is that Black and white Americans have different levels of education. That said, this trend, this persistence, is something that is deeply troubling to many um, political uh, actors and academics. And one of the things that we ask is, how is it that we could improve this? But let me just say that this level of inequality pales in comparison to wealth inequality. It is far smaller than the wealth inequality that we see in this country. So um, here, this is income inequality, the amount of money that people make. Wealth inequality set of assets that people have control over, which could include housing or stocks or something like that, is far greater as a level of inequality between racial and ethnic groups. Whites have 13 times the wealth of Black Americans in the years after the Great Recession. Um, and so that's like basically 2012, 2013, 2014. I'll repeat that. Whites have 13 times the wealth of Black Americans. So, you know, here, when we're looking at these gaps, we're looking at gaps at around, you know, 50%, not even one time, not even twice as much. Um, but in terms of wealth, it's 13 times as, as great. Much of that wealth inequality, much of that wealth inequality is explained by household wealth, by which I mean the wealth that people have located in their physical home itself and within their families uh, tied to those, those households. And that such household wealth inequality was largely the product of the sets of redlining um, policies that I talked about in a previous lecture. So that household wealth is tied to a set of federal policies that supported the development of white household wealth and excluded Blacks from being able to do the same thing. But whether or not we look at income or race or any number of things, we see that there's been some marginal shrinking, some small shrinking in um, the racial gaps, but that they have been persistent, stubbornly persistent over time. So in perhaps some educational attainment still exists. In other words, whites have higher rates of education than blacks. Um, uh, gaps in health are considerable. Um, so that there are huge racial and ethnic disparities in health outcomes. Um, we see this most dramatically in infant mortality. When we get to our lecture on health and illness, we'll see just how much more likely it is for Black infants to die within their first two years than white infants. Um, we see this in mortality overall. So if you look at the life expectancy of Blacks and whites, we see massive differences overall in the life expectancy of Blacks and whites. And in other domains, we, we see this, this happen again and again. As much as the civil rights movement brought some degree of political opportunity to Black Americans, 
and helped close maybe a little bit of um, uh, uh, some of the racial um, wealth, income, health, and educational gaps. It has clearly not been effective. And if you look at this graph, you should see the relative ineffectiveness at interventions in helping moderate or get rid of racial inequalities. And this should be something that we are deeply concerned about. Now, my lecture today has been highly American, um, and actually my lecture about race and ethnicity more generally, a set of lectures has been highly American in part because it's what I know about, it's the literature I'm, I'm familiar with, and I myself am an American scholar. But I will say that in many areas, you see these persistent forms of racial and ethnic um, inequalities. Uh, and part of the reason why is that such inequalities are not just sustained by active, explicit bias discrimination, but instead are often implicitly founded and organizationally and institutionally supported. So that ranges of organizational and institutional policies help perpetuate these kinds of inequalities over time. So in order to understand the persistence of racial inequality, I think I want us to think about four to five, four dimensions here. The first is public policy, the second is discrimination, the third is shift in economic conditions, and the fourth is um, cultural. So by public policy, what I mean are the public policies, the explicit public policies that helped create racial inequality and even today help to sustain it. So one of the things that we have seen over the last three years um, is a series of public policies that will undoubtedly help support racial inequality. Um, and those public policies are voter suppression efforts. And by voter suppression efforts, what I mean is the closing of huge numbers of voting locations, primarily in poor and black neighborhoods. So this is something that happened after the Supreme Court decided in the United States that there was no longer a need for the federal government to oversee um, some regions of the U.S.'s um, uh, electoral systems with an eye to racial inequality. And that opened the floodgates, where in large numbers of states began to basically shut down um, polling stations. This is part of the disenfranchisement of Black Americans, the ways in which they're explicitly, explicitly limited in terms of being allowed to vote in ways that seem kind of neutral, like, oh, we're just closing down polling places because they're expensive to maintain, but really are, are ways in which to make sure that Black Americans can't vote and engage in political um, uh, processes. And this means that people who might enact public policies that are committed to racial equality are less likely to be um, uh, um, uh, voted. And, you know, there are other forms of public policy that help with racial inequalities um, um, persisting. So um, we'll talk about some of these when it comes to health and um, uh, uh, wellness. Um, but for now, I think I've given plenty of examples from redlining to the exclusion from the GI Bill as well as social security to the closing of polling stations where public policies are an explicit way in which racial inequality is um, maintained. Discrimination is another. And in the opening lecture of this series of lectures, I told you about Diva Pager's work um, about the mark of a criminal record, about the impact of having a criminal record on your record. And in that, I noted that there were strong effects for having a criminal record on the likelihood of employment. But there were strong effects for many other things, uh, including race. So independent of having a criminal record, race was very consequential that um, uh, employers uh, didn't call back uh, black applicants at the same rates as white applicants. And this is actually something we see, we see a lot of, explicit labor market discrimination where um, black applicants are less likely to be hired for jobs than white applicants. They're less likely to get callbacks. There is a myth of affirmative action in employment 
that black applicants have um, a much higher likelihood of being able to get a job. But again and again and again, in experimental studies that seek to look at the causal impact of race on employment, where two applicants are exactly the same except for their race, we find that employers are less likely to hire the black applicants. Shifts in economic conditions are also important for understanding the changing um, nature of uh, racial inequality. Um, uh, there are all kinds of economic changes that have happened in um, the world economy over the last um, 40 years. Uh, think about how it is that I'm speaking to you right now from the digital screen, um, something that's been um, uh, recorded or um, there's a video recording made of it. And that that is a, a shift overall in the ways in which we produce things and work. And um, there has been um, changes in the economic structure that reflect what's, what economists call skill biased technological change, a range of technical um, uh, changes that give increasingly high rewards to particular skills. So skill biased technological change is that there are biases towards particular skills driven by technological change that rewards some versus others. The way that labor market economists and sociologists think about this is that the labor market conditions have changed, that there are greater rewards to particular kinds of skills, and that those skills are more likely to be seen among white versus black Americans. And so while there was some impact of the decline of inequality overall, that's been moderated by the fact that the economic conditions in the world have changed enormously. Changes in policy in urban economies have led to shifts in factors like family structure, contributing also to persistent racial inequality. So um, uh, one of the largest drivers of inequality right now in the United States is whether or not parents are married and cohabit with one another. So whether or not parents are married to and cohabit you can think of this simply that as more women enter the labor force, which um, happened through the 70s, 80s, and into the 90s, if those women are living with a partner who also is in the labor force, then the incomes of those families will go up by nearly 80%. And so family structure, whether or not two parents live together or two people live together and raise children, um, or two people live together and don't raise children, but live together and share expenses and um, have two incomes rather than one, you'll have massive, massive increases in their household wealth. So some of the household inequalities um, that we see are driven by changes in family structure over time. You know, finally, um, and we're going to return to this in uh, about four or five lectures. You guys may be listening to these or following along in any one sequence. So maybe I shouldn't say it that way, but we'll return to it when talking about uh, stratification and inequality in urban sociology. Um, one of the reasons why racial inequality persists is because racial segregation has persisted for so long. And opportunities come to people not just from being qualified, but also in part by drawing upon the networks of people who we are associated with. And concentrations of racial neighborhoods, so residential segregation, lead to concentrations of all other things. In future lectures, I'll draw upon the work of William Julius Wilson, who talks about the impact of concentrated poverty, or how being poor isn't just about being poor. It's about who's around you. And if you're a poor person surrounded by other poor people, the impacts are more negative to you than other ones. Racial segregation under conditions of racial inequality may aggravate the overall levels of inequality. Or put differently, if you're in a racially concentrated neighborhood and that neighborhood has fewer resources overall, the outcome a generation from now is going to be to augment the overall level of inequality or to increase 
the overall level of inequality. And so some things like the use of space and geographic dimensions of, um, of segregation and where people live and work can help reproduce inequalities. I want to end um, with what in the moment of this recording is the current condition in the United States. Um, and to think about how the Black Lives Matter movement may be a moment of change. And this is a very contemporary graph. It shows us like what levels of support um, voters have for Black Lives Matter in this moment. Um, and you know, the Black Lives Matter movement was not very popular until 2018. Um, so the sets of movements that were protesting massive racial inequalities in the United States were not popular at all. You see that before 2018, there were more people that didn't support it than supported it. But since 2018, there has been increasing support for the Black Lives Matter movement. And more recently, with the waves of protests over the Black Lives Matter system, we've had huge increases in support. So that now, almost there's almost a 30% th um, swing where, you know, 30% people, more people support Black Lives Matter than do not support it. So in the last two weeks, so when I'm actually talking to you right now, um, American voter support for Black Lives Movement has increased almost as much as it did in the previous two years. So, you know, this suggests that maybe we're in a moment of change. But I also want us to know how persistent racial inequality is in this moment. America is experiencing a COVID crisis um, where um, 140,000 people at the time of my speaking have died, but that those people are not random people. In fact, they're heavily patterned and it reflects deep patterns of racial inequality in health in the United States. Age-adjusted death rates for COVID-19, age-adjusted meaning given the fact that Black Americans are less likely to be older than white Americans. Um, so age-adjusted death rates are three and a half times higher for Black Americans than white Americans. That bears repeating. Black Americans are three and a half times more likely to die of COVID than white Americans. And a series of police shootings that was in part inspired this increased protest around the Black Lives Matter movement has helped provide a reminder of just how, what institutionalized violence looks like and how institutionally violent the American state can be to Black Americans. And these protest movements may be effective ways of drawing upon this. So we might ask, are we in a moment of change where we look at these death rates of COVID and say, it's unacceptable that Blacks are three and a half times more likely to die than whites, that it's unacceptable to have Black Americans experience the kind of institutional violence that they've experienced from the police, and that these protest movements in gaining support are going to transform these conditions in beneficial ways. I have to say personally, I'm a little skeptical that there'll be massive transformation, but also personally, I'm deeply hopeful because of just how persistent these inequalities have been.